Hello, women's Alzheimer's people. Wham. Wham, wham. Wow, wham. Lizzie Simon joined. You are the first person to join the very first wham now. Look at that. I'm so excited that you have joined Wham Now. Michael Pope Radio, thank you for joining Wham Now. Story Media, thank you for joining Wham Now. Smith Doreen, uh, thank you for joining Wham Now. What is Wham Now? You are about to find out. Um, I'm Maria Shriver, and I want to welcome you to Wham Now. This is the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Live Conversations. And these are conversations about women's health, brain health, Alzheimer's prevention, caregiving, everything that the women's Alzheimer's movement is focused on. Hi, Senior Home Cares. Thank you so much for joining us. Wave, look at all these things. Senior Home says Wave. Mal Huck joined Wave. I haven't seen that. Kristen Mikoff, uh, one of the Sunday Paper Ambassadors. Hi, thank you for joining. Uh, somebody say, oh, Karen, thank you. I just came from your and Patrick's stream over on mine. So thank you for joining. Thank you for coming over. I really appreciate that. Um, this is super exciting. Um, our hope is to invigorate this account, let you know what the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, AKA WHAM, is all about, what it does. Um, WHAM was born uh, to try to understand why two-thirds of all the cases with Alzheimer's belong to women. Nobody knew why that is, so WHAM went out and said, let us investigate that, let us fund some research, let us work to educate women and their families about brain health, let us support caregivers, let us support researchers who are looking at Alzheimer's and who are looking at it in a new way, uh, let us invest uh, in women-based research because we have a knowledge gap, we have a research gap. So WHAM has really led the way in trying to understand why Alzheimer's impacts women. We've made great strides and we're also really focused on getting people to know about their brains and to do all they can to prevent Alzheimer's. We don't have a cure for Alzheimer's, we don't have a magic pill, uh, but what we do know is that lifestyle matters. What we do know is that there are things that you can do that keeps your brain working, that keeps your brain healthy, that feeds your brain, and that's really what WHAM is out there doing, day in, day out, working, uh, to better understand Alzheimer's, to better understand the prevention space, to better educate in the brain health space. So this is what WHAM does. The WHAM account is um, about showing you what we do. It's about hearing from you. We have a newsletter, we have a website. Now we have a live conversation series and these conversations will be with people that we uh, support in terms of research that'll be with different doctors that uh, share the same message as we do. Um, and our hope is that these conversations will educate you, engage you, empower you, and um, help you to live your life, engage with your brain and your body and moving forward so that your brain can last for as long as possible. So Editor Christina, Editor Christina is, uh, I don't know Editor Christina, wave to her, but she always leaves me really great questions on my Instagram. And now I'm really glad that she's over here on Wham uh, because Wham is certainly a passion and a mission for me. So Editor Christina, thank you uh, for joining. I, I just did a um, conversation series with my son Patrick on Maria Shriver. And we said at the end of it, we were talking with my colleague Stephanie Rule at NBC about the new unemployment figures, about the reopening of the economy or not reopening of the economy, how to apply for these small business loans, um, how to apply for new unemployment. Uh, and so I said at the end of that, please come over uh, to Wham. Oh, Editor Christina saying her grandma had Alzheimer's. So that's good. And I'm being told that Drew is here, which is great, but I just wanted to explain before Drew joined us who Wham is, what Wham wants to do in the world, and why we want you to jo join us at Wham and to tell your friends. So I will find Dr. Drew, not to worry, not to worry. 
there is Drew. I will add Drew in it before I added Drew so that there were some people here for Drew. So there is Drew. He's connected. Hi, Drew. Hi, Maria. How are we? We're doing all right, but we connected on Instagram Live, so I'm very happy. Well, I'm very happy. Dr. Drew Ramsey is a leading voice in brain health and in emotional health and in dealing with anxiety and doing so many different things. We have talked a lot. We have partnered. I'm a huge advocate of his work. And um, so I'm really glad that he's the first person to join on Wham! Now. And you are at home, are you I'm not? Here. I'm here on the farm. Maria, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you and to, to be the first of many great Instagram lives you're going to be doing helping us get through this. I'm yes. beaming to you. I never thought I would be beaming to you from my farm in Indiana. Uh -huh. But yes, I'm, I'm here in Crawford County, Indiana, which is very rural southern Indiana. And, and you're there with your mom, right? I'm here with my mom and my dad, both of who are, are my dad's 80, my mom's 78. Wow. And, and then my wife and our two kids, uh, who you've, you've met those folks. So, yes, um, and we're like week six of being all together. So, and how is that going for you? Because very often you're going back and forth between your home there and your practice in New York, where you see people uh, to work with their own emotional and mental health issues and brain health issues. How is it for you being sequestered there at home? And what are you dealing with? Well, we're in a really blessed situation that my life usually is going back and forth and wondering which place I'm supposed to live. And so it's really nice for me that the universe has chosen for a little while. And it's a very nice time here in Indiana. We have a beautiful farm and the farm's just coming alive in spring. So it's been really meaningful for us, especially with all of the sphere and um, uh, concern and uncertainty to be together as a family. I know for folks who are watching who are separated from their family, that's so hard right now. And for those of you who are together, it's challenging. I mean, I'm not saying it's, <laughs> it's we, we're, we're on like week six of dishing out six dinners, like so many of you are. <laughs> so Dr. Drew, let's talk a little bit because Wham now really wants to give people practical information about what they can do now. Mm -hmm. uh, to either prevent Alzheimer's and or care for their health, uh, their brain health, and their overall emotional and mental health. What is, the, in your opinion, the most important thing, if you're concerned about your brain health, that you can do today to keep your brain healthy? So I think the number one thing is to have a plan and be chipping away at it every day. I think so often people focus on a singular thing as opposed to taking a step back and really doing the most important thing you can do for your health and your brain health, which is make it number one. Because the best thing about you, uh, everyone, best thing about Maria is our brains. I mean, that's just what makes you creative and lovable and connects you with everything in your life. And so let's make that number one. And then what would that, not that heart health isn't important or diabetes aren't important, it's just all those at the end of the day really are there to support your brain. And so from whether it's food, which is my focus as a nutritional psychiatrist on what are the best foods we should be eating at each stage yeah. of our life to keep our brain robust and healthy. And and so many uh, of the the great Wham supporters, um, Lisa Moscone, Max Lugaver, uh, Richard Isaacson, they, all of us really uh, promote food and food as medicine for the brain. Food is brain medicine. The other aspects, I think, that are really also critically important, and we can talk about why food works so well from the microbiome to reducing inflammation. I mean, there's all of that. But um, I, I think it, 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 there are also these other aspects of stress reduction, for example, mm -hmm. something a lot of us say and talk and, and a lot of us need to do a better job at, especially right now, whether that's deep breathing or yoga. Um, and then, of course, movement. You know, I mean, this is why this is why it's the women's Alzheimer's movement. Uh, right. such a, you've been such an av advocate of the importance of everyone, and particularly women, moving their bodies and staying physically fit as a way of really combating uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. But also, you know, the data is there as well for depression and anxiety. And so, so a lot of people here, Drew, are saying, you know, my dad died with Alzheimer's. My mom has Alzheimer's. I'm terrified that I will get it. Will I get it? And so let me just hit that up at the top. Drew, nor I, nor anybody can tell you 100% you're going to get Alzheimer's uh, if your parent had it. 
It doesn't mean if your parent had it that you'll get it. And it doesn't mean you won't get it if you didn't have it in your family. So the most important thing that all of us can do is to take care of our overall health, right? Because we're hearing a lot with COVID about pre-existing conditions. And I think you're talking a little bit here, Drew, about brain health. And people are like, well, what do I eat for my brain? I don't really understand that. So can you give people two or three things that they could eat that will actually help their brains? Yes, for sure. And, and really, there have been some great comments of people talking about their, their desire to avoid the disease. And that's what helps motivate me, whether it's the, the depression that runs in my family or the addiction that runs in my family or the dementia that runs in my family. I really see food as one of my central tools for decreasing my risk of those illnesses. And so in nutritional psychiatry, I try and help people focus on food categories as opposed to singular nutrients. We all know omega-3s are important for us, but what's really important for me as a provider is I want you to know what are the top food sources of omega-3 right. fats. So those are your fatty fish. I have a little rhyme. I often say seafood greens, nuts and beans, and a little dark chocolate. And then we also throw fermented foods in there. I, mean, I don't know how to make that rhyme, Maria. Maybe you're more musical yes. than I am. Those food categories are have the nutrients that your brain needs. And a lot of, I think, us have kind of, kind of turned around over the years of, of all of the different advice. And what I think has remained true throughout that is whole foods and traditional diets, whether it's the Mediterranean diet, the Japanese diet, I'm even gonna say the real traditional American diet that was made from the food grown out here on an Indiana farm, not made in uh, you know, a factories of processed food, that those, those foods have always supported brain health. And when we emphasize getting more seafood, particularly the bivalves, mussels, clams, and oysters. You're just mega dosing B12, zinc, selenium, uh, protein, all things that we know are really important for brain health. And so that, those are some of the foods and food categories we really try and emphasize. I mainly treat people with depression and anxiety, but, but those diseases and dementia are so inextricably linked. When you yes. have depression, your risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease goes up. And so it, it, but we really view these illnesses more and more on a continuum. And what's exciting about that is that it gets us all in that more action-oriented mode of caring for our brain. So are you saying to people who might be new to this conversation, for example, because you have the Brain Food Clinic, are you saying to people who might be struggling with anxiety, who might be struggling with depression, who might have Alzheimer's in their family, and for those who don't, that really they can kind of adjust their brain health by what they actually put on their plate. 100%, Maria. I'm saying that with more and more evidence, more and more confidence, and I, I think more and more um, uh, optimism and challenge. And I don't want anyone to be mistaken because so many people struggle with depression or Alzheimer's disease, yeah. and, and they're eating everything right, or they're at a stage in that illness where you know food might help, but that's not what needs to be done right now. Yeah. And so I never want to oversell it, it but if, if, there, um, if it were a medicine, it would be a billion dollar medicine every year, right? I mean, what else? It would be our favorite pill to take. And so, and also food, you know, it's more than just the nutrients, Maria, as you know, and as everybody watching knows, food connects us. When we cook with our family, when, when someone cooks for us and serves us a great meal, when we grow a vegetable, when we chop vegetables, when we have a glass of wine with friends and family, like those are the richest moments in our life. Mm -hmm. And so nutritional psychiatry is, is both those foods and food nutrients, seafood greens, nuts and beans, and a little dark chocolate, and fermented foods, which I'll work into the rhyme, but, but also this notion of finding more joyfulness when yeah. we are engaged with our self-nourishment. How do, you, how do you do that, Drew, uh, for people out there who've just lost their job, uh, just lost uh, their income, who might be filing for unemployment, who don't know when they're going back to work, who might be at home caring for a parent with Alzheimer's, with mild cognitive impairment, who are finding themselves in the most stressful time of their lives? Yes, well, uh, that is where a lot of people, 22 million Americans are right now. And so let's just get to the brass tacks of it. Brain food is a better value for you than any other food. Other foods might be a little cheaper, but they're not going to serve you in the way that um, a lot of these foods will. 
and, and most brain foods aren't expensive. One of the only randomized trials to test the Mediterranean diet to treat clinical depression, an incredible trial called the SMILES trial done by Felice Jacka. The participants were counseled on a Mediterranean diet. They saved over $1,000 a year on food. And so wow. by choosing foods like lentils, dried red beans, canned salmon, uh, canned clams, where you can make amazing pasta vongoli, great salmon burgers. You can do so much with inexpensive foods. And so first of all, I wanna remind everybody that no matter where you are on your budget, this isn't about like $15 organic blueberries in the middle of the winter. This is about you embracing where you are and on every budget you can feed your brain. Uh, I'm, I'm out here in Crawford County. I do a lot of shopping at Walmart and at the JC store. Um, uh, that's where we get our groceries and from our neighbors where we get a lot of our meat and our eggs. So you can do it anywhere. So I should mention here that uh, Drew actually has books that you can get at your local bookstore through local uh, book um, companies, independent stores, or obviously through Amazon that deal with a lot of what he's talking about that can guide you through, eat complete the 21 nutrients that fuel brain power, boost weight loss, and transform your health. Um, and uh, prescription for a sharp brain, balanced mood, lean gene, energized body, everything you need to know about keeping your brain healthy, managing your stress, and basically fortifying yourself, right, in order to get the best long life that you possibly can. That, that and fortification and building resiliency is exactly what it's about, Maria. So, many, so, many, so often I find people have this real dialectic. They make a real division of kind of like meds or no meds or, or foods or, you know, only these foods as opposed to this really more integrative approach to mm -hmm. our brain health and to really embrace so many of us have individual needs. So many of us have individual genetic narratives and stories and histories. And that it, it's really helped me as a clinician, I guess, take on all of my biases and, and really embrace one thing, which is we're all going for that same goal of feeling well and having great cognitive health. And, and I think that's uh, why I love, I love the women's Alzheimer's movement so much, that celebration of it, that like getting us together and connecting us around brain health um, mm -hmm. uh, and creating community around that, which is so important, especially right now where you know, brain health is an issue for everyone. I love this pivot where let's, let's stop talking about mental illness and brain illness. Let's talk about brain health because then we're all on board. We're all trying to take care of it. We're all acknowledging that, you know, we've, we've been given this like miracle up there. I mean, it's really cool, all the things you can do with it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so hard, right? It's so hard for people to think or, or, you know, think about something they can't see or how to keep your brain front and center in your life. You know, you think about the food you eat and how it's gonna look on your thighs or on your butt or in your stomach. But we don't, we're not raised thinking about how that same food looks on our brain or what it does for our brain. Do you have any tricks on that to get, so like well, before you go and pick up something, how to think about that it's going to play up here? For sure. And, you know, I see a lot, as a psychiatrist, I'm really blessed. I get to see a lot of people fall in love and achieve their dreams and, and overcome just, you know, incredible obstacles. <laughs> and, and so it's really made me a, a, a big believer in, in, in the power of the human mind and also a big believer that there's this disconnection. There's this, this disconnect you're talking about um, that we don't, we don't kind of see it. We don't think about this couple pounds up here is the most important thing. And you're right, we all yeah. worry about what we look. I mean, I got in the shower for the first time for a little while right before this to make sure I looked good, right? I mean, we're worried about this. I think first is acknowledging that, but when you're looking at food, foods that make you feel badly, whether it's that you're feeling guilty about them, um, or th that, that right there is a red flag. Like mm -hmm. for example, I mentioned dark chocolate in that rhyme. I mean, a lot of people where their snack, their treat, their chocolate is this guilty pleasure that they're worried about all the time. When you're eating brain food, you can eat dark chocolate with abandon because real good pure dark chocolate is a great brain food. It's full of fiber and magnesium and iron and nutrient density. You can't eat too much of it. It's full of fiber. Try and eat a whole really big dark chocolate bar. I mean, you can, but it takes a little while and you'll probably feel good about it. That's probably the best news of COVID. Eat dark chocolate with eat abandon. Eat dark chocolate. Eat dark yeah. chocolate. Uh, yeah. 
that that some kale chips. I mean, I, 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 COVID is a great time to get back in touch with how great you are at feeding yourself and taking care of yourself. It really now, is. A lot of, Drew, a lot of people might be like you. They find themselves at home with small children and parents. Uh, so you're kind of sandwiched in. There are millions of people uh, your age, your wife's age, that are in this sandwiched generation. What advice do you have for people like yourself who are trying to balance both uh, ends of the age spectrum? Uh, try to clone my wife. I think that would be <laughs> um, uh, my advice. We call it the I call it the Jerry Petty unit, geriatric pediatric, and that there's some similarities in those needs. I really try and understand and embrace my role, even though it's really hard sometimes. And, and to do a better job. I've definitely had a lot of months here where I haven't done a good job. I've lost my patience. Um, I've become agitated. I haven't, I haven't liked what caregiving at times has turned me into. Grumpy, irritable. I'm sure everybody who's watching, who's taking care of someone that's struggling with their memory uh, knows what I'm talking about. It just, it, and it's, it's scary because there's this need to function and then there's this sadness. Um, it's not like people, you know, all of a sudden they're gone cognitively, right? There, there are little pieces that, that come and go. And right. also for uh, the elderly folks and, and the younger folks, you know, things like food, like if you, they're not great at getting them for themselves, they're okay at helping and cleaning up, they're, um, at, but they're really dependent on it. And if you ask them a lot of times, hey, do you want, you know, it's like, you want a, something to eat? How about some lunch? They say, oh no. <laughs> Both the young ones and the old ones where, but then you put food in front of them and they're, devouring it. So um, I think my advice is, is maybe uh, a little boring, but it's, it's to remember your role and to stay strong, to remember that it's a period of your life. And I think I try and really just as I do with my kids to, you know, not blink too much and try and be present every day. I've increasingly been trying to do that with my folks, but really just um, uh, embracing that caregiving role. That, and, and then the other part is just don't forget about you. I mean, I, I also treat myself really well. Um, I, 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 you know, if I don't feel like exercising, I don't. If I do I feel like exercising, I do, and I celebrate it. Um, I am not too hard on myself about all the Triscuits that I've been eating, um, or maybe the extra drink I've had here and there. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to understand, especially right now, everyone. Right? That, that, that you must be incredibly kind to yourself and others. And when you're not feeling that, that that's an indication it's time to kind of, we're talking about the empathy gas tank. And yeah. The empathy gas tank is running low for all of us. Just I, think that, right now. I think that's a really hard balance for so many people. Uh, you mentioned the caregiving role, the caretaking role. Uh, so many people find themselves, uh, if they're in that role, feeling guilty that they're not doing that role 24-7. Uh, caregivers, we hear so much about all the doctors and the nurses running you know, to the hospital to care for everybody with COVID, and we should be hearing about them because they are doing heroic work, but so are the caregivers, the home health care workers that are also on the front lines, and they're often on the front lines in their own home, and you might be one of them, right? As how do they also care about their brain health, especially since we know that stress is mm -hmm. such a bad thing for your brain and for your emotional and physical health, be you female, male, whatever, right? It, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting the sunbeam coming in here, but it's a good, it's a good time for us to really be in that kind of battle mode that, you know, this isn't, it, at all times we should be promoting brain health and taking care of ourselves just a little bit every day, but that's adding some leafy greens to your pasta sauce or, going for an extra little bit of a walk but the um uh, right now i mean you're right the stress is is so intense everyone's yeah. having these thoughts we haven't dread fear that we just haven't had anyone who is taking care of someone who is older i mean i'm i'm you know when I, I, I went to the grocery store i had the worst day i've had in this I, I, I lost my cool a little bit on the way out to the uh, grocery store um, as my folks offered to help as oftentimes people who are struggling with some cognitive impairment, they want to be very helpful. And, and the act of going there, how different it was, it was just really disruptive to me. Um, and, and I think it's very important to, to again, recognize that that mental health challenge 
and then really bolster with your coping skills. Really be very more intentional about that. It's kind of like every day, you're gonna get punched a few times. Like no matter how well you defend yourself. And, and that's a horrible thing to think about, right? But there are all kinds of ways that you would wanna compensate for that. And you would wanna take care of yourself. You would, and so maybe it's a horrible analogy, Maria, but, but <clears throat> really doubling down on self-care. There's a lot of talk about it. It's yeah. really critical for caregivers because so much, as you know, so much depends on you. And it, I'm saying it adamantly because it's so hard to prioritize yeah. because you're also caring for other people. I think that's really good advice uh, from Dr. Drew Ramsey about if you find yourself in the caregiving role, the caretaking role, whatever you want to call it, the grown-up child role, that um, doing your best, telling yourself you're doing your best, but then also being able to step away and say, you know, how do I care for myself? How do I care for my emotions? And how do I care for my brain health if I want it? If I want to last as long as I possibly can, there are things I need to do today to make sure I don't go down the wrong road tomorrow. And I think that's really what we want these conversations to be about, right, Drew? You're talking about, like, it's easy to lose your temper. It's easy to feel like your routine is disrupted. But having to come back to that over and over again and say, like, wait a minute, I need to practice self-compassion. I need to remember that there are things that I can do today that are good for my emotional health and my brain health. Yes, and, 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 you, and you should, just, just as we're kind of going through those activities of daily living, we're trying to eat and sleep um, and <clears throat> get our checklist done of, of work and homeschooling, all that stuff. Really, you know, even if it's five or 10 minutes, there needs to be time on there for you. Uh, and, and, that, 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 and especially now, I've heard a lot from a lot of my patients you know, they're needing to find new and different coping skills. If, if you really get your feeling of connection and, and, and relaxation from your yoga class or you see your friends, uh, you know, sure, you can do a Zoom yoga class. Like, thank goodness for that. But it's not the same. It doesn't feel the same way. And so yeah. that's where it's time to really mourn that a little bit. It'll be back. I don't know when. Nobody does, but it will be. And you'll enjoy it even more. Uh, but until then, what's, what's going to compensate? Um, how will you, uh, and that's where I, I've been really enjoying seeing all the creativity, all the people making sourdough bread and planting little, you know, herbs and such in their gardens and um, uh, uh, doing puzzles and playing games. Uh, I think that's really been, I don't know, kind of delightful rediscovery of home life that a lot of us, I think all of us like, but a lot, I don't know, felt like recently everybody's just been saying they're all too busy. And so yeah. it's interesting that the fates have put us all together, not busy. <laughs> yeah, and as I say, it's a good chance to uh, take a look at Drew's work, read his books, but to really focus at this time, not just on your physical health, but to include thinking about your brain health. And if you do find yourself concerned about your parents' uh, cognitive impairment, to make a note write down things you're concerned about and perhaps when this is over and you can go out and go to the doctor, uh, take your mother or your father uh, to get an assessment, a neurological assessment, a cognitive assessment. There are a lot of good doctors out there. Um, but remember the most important thing once again is to be able to take care of yourself so that when the time comes or if the time is already here for you to care for a parent, you're up for the job and you're physically, mentally, emotionally strong enough to do the job. I always say caregivers are the most heroic uh, people on the planet because it's a 24 seven frontline of humanity work. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big and, and kind of wondrous job. And I think part of that, um, also remembering that there's all kinds of ways to engage. I think that you know sometimes when people in our life are struggling with their mind, whether it's depression or dementia or anxiety, um, it, it, we forget in all the wonderful ways that we can be in those states and still have really meaningful, human, loving, interesting interactions. And so, yeah. you know, if you're in that state with people, just remember, you know, it's where I guess having kids is helpful, like crafts, like we were having a hard day. And then one of the boxes, my wife had ordered this beeswax candle kit. And oh boy, it was, an, I mean, every, it was so much fun making candles and everybody got creative and it's very tactile and it smells wonderful. And it just, you know, gave everyone a sense of, everybody made a candle, gave everyone a sense of accomplishment and a sense of, um, you know, focus, which, which yeah. is hard right now. So um, 
uh, you know, my, my dad is, um, makes a couple of really great dishes, like uh, makes a really interesting Indian seafood dish that my kids love. And so in the midst of all this, as I'm feeling like, oh, I want a little more help, I've been more intentional of really honoring and focusing on the things that they can do and do well. And, yeah. and um, but yes, everybody take care of your mental health and take care of yourself. Uh, Maria, I'm wondering what you're doing. You always inspire us, and I always get your Sunday paper and your quotes and sit with it, and it's it's been a really meaningful part of uh, getting to know you better and, and uh, I guess just my own kind of sense of my spiritual wanderings. And I'm wondering what um, what you're doing and, and what kind of inspiration we can find from some of your coping mechanisms and routines. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for asking that. That's really sweet of you. Um, well, I have a meditation practice that I do every morning. I kind of, you know, I get up and I have a routine, right? I make my bed. I, you know, come down, I make my coffee. I sit in silence. My son has moved in with me and his girlfriend. So that has been awesome, but it's different, right? So I try to stay on that routine in the morning of my meditation and setting my intention for the day. And then at the evening, I try to walk. I, uh, even if I'm just walking alone um, to kind of reconnect myself, gather myself, think. Um, and uh, I have, uh, there's a lot, I have a lot of thoughts about this time, about the experience of this time and how, it's been so collective, but so individual as well, because depending on where we live, whether you're on a farm or in a one bedroom apartment in New York with uh, multiple people sharing multiple generations. I have a friend who lives in a two bedroom apartment with her kids and her parents. And um, so it's tough, right? And if you're lost your job, that's a completely different experience. And so uh, I think I'm kind of trying to process all of these different images of some people baking, some people making candles, some people standing in food lines, some people being essential workers, some people being non-essential workers. I think it's a lot to take in. So I find that time in silence helps me uh, not take too much of it in and allow it, allow what should come in, in and put what shouldn't be an out? Because sometimes I think we can take on too much, right? You also, when we, when we talk about self-care, yeah. um, sometimes people, you know, they wonder what that is. And I love the word you used, you said process. Yeah. You know, and really in therapy, that's a big word for us, right? We talk about the process that someone is in. And we're all in this exhausting process right now. There's both this kind of denial. Yeah. Like, let's try and function like they're like it's you know and let's just try and function which yeah. requires some denial of a lot of what's going on um but also that as you're saying processing a lot of images yeah. um, i remember the first time I, I just kind of lost it and started to weep was i uh at the bottom of my drawer i still have some scrubs from new york presbyterian and and i don't know a couple of weeks ago i just decided like i couldn't be there but i just wanted to like put them on as i did my telepsychiatry all day and then it was the first time we started seeing images of nurses and doctors huddled to get together and, and more of what I think we all knew were coming as images, but it sort of like, it, 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 it hit me. Yeah. And, and, and so that, that notion of processing it, of not being scared of that, yeah. it, um, uh, of sitting with that as a real true and real uh, feeling that you're having and to honor it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I love your processing walks. I mean, that's always been, that's always been a way throughout history, right? Yeah. The, the walk that has, um, and so that's a, that's a, and, and then also silence. Yeah. Which is so hard because one of our favorite coping mechanisms is distraction, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, some, so my wife doesn't really like TV or movies, but uh, somehow we started watching some movie about like the, Earth's core stopping and about five minutes in she says oh this is really good what is this and you know we just sort of got pulled into this distraction yeah. of like uh and and so that's really important but so is being really present and silent with yourself and, yeah. and as I've heard myself saying none of these feelings are going to swallow you yeah I think that's so, super important to remember that everything you need to get through this you have within you we're all going to get through this. We're going to get through it differently. 
but ideally, I hope that we will all come out of this uh, more aware uh, of our fellow human beings, more aware of people who have different experiences, and I hope we'll come out of it more thinking about pre-existing conditions, we'll think about our health perhaps in different ways, and we'll think about maybe the speed of which we're living our lives. So I wanna thank you, Dr. Drew Ramsey, for joining us on this first Wham Now. Uh, these will be conversations about women's health, about brain health, about Alzheimer's prevention, about caregiving, and we will try to keep this conversation moving forward so that your health uh, will be better. If you wanna read any of Dr. Drew's books, you can go on Amazon. Uh, and order them uh, while you're at home. Uh, if brain health is a new subject for you, his books are a great introduction uh, to the subjects and to what you can eat and how you can manage your overall health uh, in a really kind of simple contained way. So Dr. Drew Ramsey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you, have Maria. The rest of the day out on the farm, parenting, caregiving, caretaking, and also caring for yourself. I'm planning some tomatoes soon, and I hope that I'll be able to maybe share a few with you someday. I'd we'll love that. To be closer awesome. than six feet. And thank you every, for everything you're doing, and thank you so much for the women's Alzheimer's movement. I know all of us in medicine and on the science side of things, um, the impact that you all have with pushing research, with asking for de and demanding the answers that we all want, that, that, you know, I hope one of the things that comes out of this is, again, our value of science and our investment yes, in research absolutely. and NIH. Yes. And, NIMH. and so uh, I'm so thankful for you and for everyone watching for all that you're doing to rally us and bring us together. So let's, let's all make sure and eat ex extra helpings of brain food in Maria's honor and in the women's Alzheimer's movement. I'm honor. going right for that dark chocolate. Go okay. right. <laughs> thank and you, Joe. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we want to thank uh, Dr. Drew Ramsey, who joined us uh, with a lot of really good information. Uh, remember that how you feed your body does impact your brain. I hope that's a takeaway. Uh, you can go and order any of Drew's books. Uh, they're all really helpful. They're all uh, condensed, really valuable information. And I hope you'll uh, check out the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, sign up for its newsletter, sign up to support us in our work of uh, gender-based research and of educating the public about how to prevent Alzheimer's, how to take care of your health, and how to be there for those that depend on you. So thank you so much for joining WAM Now, and I hope we can count on you as a friend of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.